Okay, it's the top of the hour. Everybody can hear me? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and, and welcome to uh, another deep dive of the CREATE team. Okay, here. Um, I'm Francisco Javier Lopez, Sam for short, and I'm a senior backend engineer in the uh, CREATE team. Uh, today we are going to talk about GTLFS. Sorry, we're going to talk about uh, GTLFS, uh, but there are several topics related to GTLFS we could talk about. So we are focusing on what is GTLFS, how you can use GTLFS, the uh, specification behind GitLFS and how we have built our own LFS server uh, here at GitLab. Okay, this is the table of contents. Um, it's basically what I have just said. First of all, I want to say that uh, I think you all know this, but Git doesn't uh, track binary files like audio, uh, video, or image files the same way it does with, um, with uh, text files. Any change in a, binary, in a binary file requires to upload, to push a new copy of the whole file in the repository. Okay, we, oh, yes, Git can generate these files for binary files. So, that means that with a big um, binary file, if we made some uh, modifications or updates to it, the repository can grow really big, really quickly. So the history will also grow bigger and bigger. That means that usual operations like uh, clone, fetch, or, or pull uh, will decrease the, 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 the speed. Let me change the speed, okay? So what is Git LFS? Git LFS is an open source project. Uh, it was developed by several companies, I think um, GitHub, Bitbucket, and some more. But uh, Git LFS is a Git extension. So it's not a binary, it's not an external tool. And that also means that uh, when you install Git by default, you don't have this, this Git extension, okay? Uh, it's not only just a, a set of tools. It also set a definition uh, which we can use to create our own Git LFS client and that GitLFS basically replaces uh, binary objects with text pointers. These text pointers will go um, into the Git repository, while the binary files will go to the um, LFS server. Let me show you something really, really quick. Okay, this is a repo with, uh, with only one file and two commits. Okay, the first commit is, when, is where I added the, the, the image and the second commit is where I updated the, the image. Okay, if we take a look at the size of this repository, the object directory is almost four gigabytes. And the file size of the image is almost two gigabytes. So that means that the two, that, that the two changes uh, pushed two new uh, binary files to the repository, okay? Now uh, let's take a look at a repository uh, with Git LFS. I have the same image. 
I did the same and added the image and the repository size. Uh, As you can see, the size is only kilobytes, okay? Because we only store text pointers there. The file, the binary file, is in a different in a different uh, storage. Okay, this is how a Git LFS pointer looks like. Uh, there are only three mandatory uh, params. The first one is the version and is the URL that identifies the file spec used to generate this, this uh, text pointer. The second param is the OID, which is a hash identifier of the file. Um, at the moment, only SHA-256 is supported, and obviously, two files, two identical files, uh, get always the same uh, OID. Finally, we also have the, um, the size, the file size in, in bytes. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the repository with um, LFS enabled. Let's create a sample. With git LFS, we can get a file. We can get how the pointer is going to look like. Okay. This is not a pointer inside the repository. Is what the pointer, the, the the pointer of this file is going to look like after git uh, git LFS does his his, his magic. But how Git LFS works? Okay, first of all, um, we need a new LFS entry in our Git repository uh, config file. This entry stores the URL of the LFS server. So now we have two different concepts. We are going to have the usual remotes for Git repositories, and we will we'll also have this new LFS entry for the LFS server, okay? By default, when you install the, the Git LFS extension, uh, the LFS uh, URL is going to be the Git repository URL. Um, as you can see here, is the entry of my, of my LFS server. Okay, then, once we have installed that Git, Git, the, the, um, Git LFS extension, we have to tell it which files to track. It, it is really easy. It uses a pattern matching uh, style. So we, if we want to track only PNG files, we have to say Git LFS track and this pattern, okay? It only works for new files. Uh, so if we already have existing PNG files in the repository, we have to run git LFS migrate before. And when we execute git LFS track, uh, a new file called .git attributes will be created in the repository. And that file has to be pushed to a repository as well. Okay? In that file, we will store the filters used or the filters that git LFS will use to track which files uh, uh, replace for text pointers, okay? I mean, it doesn't track if the file is indeed a binary file. I mean, you can track text files if you want. It's just a, a pattern matching. Um, it also provides file locking capability, GTLFS, so that means that if you uh, set a lock on a file, and you push that lock to the, to the repository, nobody will be able to update that file in the repository until you remove that lock. Okay, but how GitLFS does this, this process? Through GitHooks. 
okay it's it's really it's really simple if we go to this repository uh, now in these repositories we have some default hooks let's check for example um, the pre push as you can see there is a warning first and then we call gitlfs with the command okay so under the hood every of these um, hooks will call the command git lfs okay how does this work conceptually uh, okay uh, first we perform the git push that git push get to the lfs hooks and those lfs hooks will detect if you have any file to track okay if it files that if it finds uh, any of those files it will generate a pointer with that information uh, the pointer uh, it will also replace the file with this text pointer so these pointers will go to the repository and it will send the other the real binary files to uh, to the lfs server and in a git pool uh, the process is quite similar we perform the git pool, then the repository will provide the pool data and the LFS pointers. Uh, this information will go uh, to the LFS hooks. The LFS hooks will access the LFS server with all the LFS pointers that it had found, and then the LFS server will return the binary file. With this information, we will return the pool data and the binary files to the user, finally. Authentication. Um, I have to say that GitLFS, although I think it's almost three, three or four years old, I don't remember, it still uses HTTP basic authentication. That means that for security reasons, we should use uh, HTTPS or use uh, SSH. Okay, but where do these credentials come from? It can come from uh, the Git remote or the LFS URL. I mean, you can edit the, the, the config file of the repository and put your credential there. They can come also from the usual Git credential keychain. And if the remote is through SSH, the process is a little bit different. Okay, when we perform the push, for example, uh, GitLFS will connect to the repository through SSH, uh, then it will run the command git lfs authenticate. Uh, this command is handled by GitLab cell in our case. Then GitLab cell will connect to the internal API to the LFS authenticate endpoint, and that endpoint will return a token. That token it has an expiration time inside it. And with that token, we will return a response. With uh, that response, we'll have a header section with an authorization header. Then uh, when GitLFS sees any authorization header, it will use that header in every of the following uh, requests. In our case, the authentication is handled by the controller git HTTP client controller. Basically, what it does is checks if the, if the, if the request has any authorization header, it will decode the content in that authorization, authorization header, giving us the login and the password or the login and the token and with that, with, those, with that information, it will call the method find for git client in the auth uh, class that will iterate over each of the authentication methods we already have in order to get a successful response for those credentials. And then it will uh, return this, the, the result um, class. Okay. GitLFS defines two main APIs. One is the batch 
API used to handle objects, to handle uh, binary files, and the other one is the file locking API, used only for logs. Okay, so um, one interesting thing in this in this endpoint is that it is used only to request ability to um, get information about LFS files. Okay, it's very important the concept of request the ability. If the user is not authorized, of course, uh, no information about the LFS files will be will be sent. If everything is okay in the response, we will have some information about where we can find the LFS file. Okay, usually that 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 URL, the action to access uh, the, the LFS file, is is done in a different endpoint, not through this one. This endpoint is used for both uploading and downloading and um, any of the request and the response uh, uh, involved in this key TLFS process should, no, must have these headers, okay? This is totally mandatory, this, this, this MIME type. Okay, this is how the request to the, to the former API look like. We have an operation field, uh, and it can only be upload or download. We have the transfer field, uh, which is a list of the client transfer adapters, and only basic is, is used at the moment. We also have the ref, which is a reference in the repository, and the main, the main, the main param object, which is an array of LFS objects to interact with. Okay, so in this example, what we want to do is upload. Sorry, what we want to do is to upload this object. Okay, this is how we tell the former API, the former endpoint. Hey, I want to upload this object. How do I do it? Okay, then uh, in the response, we have the transfer again, which is the, the same transfer adapter, and it's the same we use in the, in the request. And the main, the main uh, field, the, the param objects, is a, li a list of objects with information, the OID, the size, authenticated, that indicates if the request is authenticated or not, and finally, action. In actions, we see which operation can be performed. href, which is the URL where you can access the LFS file. We have the headers, which it will usually uh, be used to store the authorization uh, headers. And finally, the expiring expires in or expires at that indicates when the, the transfers will expire. So in this case, what we are going to do or what this response says is if you want to download this, uh, the, the, the LFS file with the OID 1111, you can access it in the href https gitlab.com. Okay? Okay. How LFS downloads uh, looks like in, in GitLab. First, the client, the smiley face, the GitLFS, uh, will, perform the, uh, will perform a post request to, the, to this endpoint. Uh, that request will reach to the LFS API controller. That controller will check the authorization, and if everything is okay, it will return uh, respond saying, okay, if you want to download in the, in the href, this one, you can access the LFS file. 
then the user uh, will perform a get request to the URL found in the in the uh, in the response, and that will go to the LFS storage controller. Again, that controller will perform the authentication of the user, and if it is authenticated, it will send a response with the header uh, X sent file, and the content of that file will be the path in disk of the LFS file. This is important because we are not sending any binary data from Rails to the to Git LFS. Okay, we only send a request with that header. That that request, uh, sorry, that response will be intercepted by workhorse. Workhorse will see that the X sent file header is set, and then it will get the content of that header to access the file and stream it finally to the Git LFS client. Okay, and how uploads work? The same way we perform the post request, the, the LFS API controller will authenticate this request. It will return a response with an href um, URL, and then uh, the, uh, the Git client will perform a put uh, request to that href. That, that uh, request will be intercepted by workhorse. Workhorse then will access Rails to get an authorization to perform that upload. If everything is okay, Rails says it's okay to upload that file. Workhorse will then upload the file and save it to disk, okay? And when the upload has finished, um, workhorse will send a request again to Rails saying, hey, I have finished the upload. That request doesn't have any binary data inside. The file has already been saved to disk. It only has the OID and the size and basic information. So uh, in the method verify, verify finalize of the LFS storage controller, uh, this controller will, will check if we already have this LFS object in the database, and if it is, we will link it to the current project. If not, we will create that record in the, in the database. <coughs> and now the file locking API. Okay, this is, this is really um, simple. This uh, API has four endpoints. The first one, the, the first one with the post method is to create a log. Uh, and this is important because of this is a new project, only single branch locking is support. That means that if I lock a file in master, it doesn't mean that if somebody uh, check out that branch, uh, it doesn't mean that the other users can update that file, okay, in that branch. We also have an endpoint to list all the logs and uh, another, another endpoint, the unlock endpoint to remove logs. And this is, this is interesting because uh, usually, what you expect is that you should remove only your own logs, okay? In the request of this endpoint, we can set the param uh, force to true, and that means that the, users, the user wants to remove a log from other user, owned by other user. Okay, we allow that only if the user who makes the request is a project maintainer. And makes sense, right? Okay, uh, another, and I think the final uh, endpoint, and it's really interesting, is the verify endpoint. This endpoint is used to check if any, uh, any file in your git push match any of the logs 
set in the repository. Okay. Usually, when you use a, a GitLFS, a warning is, is raised saying, hey, if you want to enable this functionality, please um, execute this command. Okay. So you have to enable it. Um, the response returned by this endpoint is split basically into uh, two fields, hours and days. The field hours will uh, store the logs created by the user that makes the request, and theirs, obviously, will be the logs owned by other users. So when you perform a git push, if any of the file matches any of the logs of the user in the field hours, the git push will succeed. And after the git push, Git LFS will display the logs involved in that Git push in order to tell you, hey, in this Git push, you, these logs are present. Maybe you want to remove them or you are aware that they exist. And the second case is if any of the files uh, matches any of the logs of others users, the Git push will hold. Okay? Is, is the expected behavior in this case. Okay, so let's take a look at the response. Here, as you can see, it's very a very simple response. In hours will be an array of the current logs owned by the user who performs the request, and in days will be the logs used by the uh, by other users and now let's code dive <coughs> um, i want to start first with the uh, roots okay in the root git uh, http you have uh, this, sorry, this three group of uh, routes. The first one would be for the batch API. The second one for the locking, the locking API. And the third one will be for the object storage. Okay, so as you can see, in the first one, in the LFS API, we have the batch, we have uh, this one are deprecated. And in the locking, we have the LF, the, sorry, the logs, we have the unlock, the verify. And here in the LFS object storage, we have the root path to download LFS files. And we also have the upload authorize and upload finalize used um, in git pushes okay as we so i mean this method will be called by workhorse so let's take a look at the lfs api controller and um, before anything what do we have to do we have to authenticate the user so that functionality is stored in the parent class in git http client controller here we have method or the, the hook authenticate user and here is where we handle the authentication of lfs files specifically here here, as we saw in the in the in the slides, we call GitLab auth and the method find for Git client, and we pass the login and the password that we want to use for that authorization. And the result would be a result um, object uh, which will allow or not this this operation. Okay. Let's suppose the user is authenticated, everything is okay. We are going to check if the request 
is a download request or an upload request. How, we, how do we do it? Just checking the operation param. Okay. Remember, uh, remember, where is it? Here, here is the request, the, 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 the request, how our request look like uh, for the batch API. We have the operation, transfer, refs, and the objects. Here is, this is what we are checking. So the process is really simple. If it's uh, if what the user wants is to download OJF, we will iterate over each of the objects in the request and then call download action. This download action, it basically create a, a hash that we will use in the, in the JSON response with the project uh, URL and then this route. Okay, this is the route we're using for the LFS object storage. You have to notice that this route is the same route we have configured here in our routes. Okay. Um, the same goes for the upload action. We will, check, we will iterate over each of the objects, then call the upload action. And in this uh, upload action, we will generate the proper response of that action, okay? Again, with the, um, with the same URL and with the same LFS object storage. Um, notice that the URL in this case is the URL when we download and the URL when we want to upload is different, okay? In uploads, we usually provide, or we have to provide the size. Why? Because we also use the size to check if the file uh, provided, or yeah, the file provided in the, in the upload has the same file, the same size that the file that we uh, that we requested. Okay, um, what else uh, do we have? Okay, let's take a look at the LFS storage controller. Remember, that controller is this one. It's the one that will download, that will uh, specifically download or allow the uploads to the LFS object storage. So this is the one that the Git clients will talk to when sending files and getting files, right? Mainly when you download. When you upload, you don't really talk to this endpoint. The only, uh, only workers talk to this endpoint. Okay, but, you, but uh, yes, you use the, 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 you use the same URL. And as you can see, let me go really quickly. Um, workhorse uses the same URL, okay? It's only uh, at the, the suffix authorized or in this case without it, okay? But only workhorse talked to the uh, LFS storage controller for upload. Okay, first of all, what, would you, what do we have to do when somebody reaches a controller? Authentication, okay? The same way the LFS API controller uh, did, um, this class is a subclass of the Git HTTP client controller, so it's the same method again. It calls the authenticate user hook, and then it calls the GitLab of, clear, uh, GitLab of uh, class. So if the user is authenticated, then, uh, we will check if the, if the LFS file exists, and if it exists, we will call send upload. Send upload, basically, uh, send uh, file upload. 
okay? This is a concern, and it will reach this file, this, this line, sorry. This file, in this file, we will, or we will tell Rails to call the send file method with this path, okay? This method is the one that will, well, not this, me this method, okay? But let's say this method does, does that. This method will set the header x send file in the response, okay? So here we are not sending any data, any data to the Git client. We are sending the path of the binary file to workhorse. Then workhorse with that path is the one that will open the file and string the file to the final user. <clears throat> okay, now we have two methods. We have upload, authorize, and we have upload, finalize. In upload, authorize, workhorse is going, uh, is telling us, hey, somebody want to um, upload this file. What do we do? Can I do it? Can I authorize it? And then based on the response, we will, we will allow it or not. And once the upload has finished, this method will be called. Again, it will be called by a request sent by workhorse. We will go to store file, and what this does is first check if those object exists, and if it exists, we call link to project. Link to project, um, what it does is to uh, check first if the LFS file exists, and if it exists, it will link the LFS file to the project. And if not, it will create um, the LFS uh, file in the database because what we have is a network. There is only one LFS file, okay? But it's, it can be linked to different projects, okay? In order not to um, repeat the same record in the database. So the main problem here is that if we delete a project, we only delete the relationship, okay? Between the project and the LFS object. If all the projects uh, are deleted, the LFS uh, project, sorry, the LFS uh, binary file will remain in the database forever. So that's why we have a, a, a service that, uh, that uh, run periodically in order to clean um, orphan LFS uh, objects, okay? And uh, finally, let's go to the LFS Logs API controller. This is a really simple controller. We have the basic operations, we have create, we have index, and then we have also verify and unlock. Okay, create is used to um, create the log, uh, unlock to remove the log, index to list them, and verify to um, check if the LFS, if the log exists. Here you can see that the result of this finder is split into the response, hours, and days, okay? And that response here is what we saw in the slides. I mean, this, this Git LFS is, right now, is um, the specification is really simple, basically because we don't have many functionalities yet. For example, we can't lock a file uh, across branches. We can only encode um, using SHA-256. But as you can see, it's really easy 
to create your own uh, client, your own Git LFS client, and your own um, Git LFS server. In this case. Okay, and I think that's all I wanted to talk about because I mean I can go into details with LFS objects, LFS logs, but I mean they are pretty pretty simple. So um, I think I prefer if you have any questions to talk and and answer them. So let me stop. Okay. Let me check the chat really quickly. Uh, okay. And we still write to this for temporary storage, even when we are configured to use up the server. Is this your standard as well? Yes, I think so. I mean, I'm not an expert here because I'm, I don't know what uh, workforce does under the hood, but it's what I think. I can I can I can uh, solve your doubt about HE configuration. Sorry, Jarp. I have no idea. Uh, as far as no, it does be stored on the first and this line in the background with a uh, 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 the model. Okay. Company. Okay. Now. In the document, yes, there will be a recording in YouTube and filter, I think. I think uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, if the token expires, Every request has the authorization header. So in, this, in that case, I think it will have to uh, re-authenticate for that, yes. We how many files are stored in LFN? Okay, you are asking and responding and answering yourselves. Christian, you can talk if you want, because it will be not. It's a very large version of request in Python. Yeah, it's a simplification three. Yeah, I mean it's it's not really how how it works internally, but it has simplification concept a conceptual simplification of how how uh, it works. I mean it will be interesting. I don't know if you will be interested in knowing how uh, the Git LFS client specification is, because we don't have to deal with that yet at GitLab, but I mean, if you are interested, I'm, I'm happy to, to help you with that. Okay, um, any other question that you can verbalize or? If not, I think, we're done. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you enjoyed and see you all soon. Okay. Bye everybody. Thanks Tom.